Good afternoon, everyone. Um, Elaine Schlesher is a freelance software engineer and WordPress consultant living in Germany. He is the maintainer of WPCLI and is sponsored by Yoast to work on WordPress core, where he maintains the bootstrap slash load component and tries to tackle their architectural pain points of this popular CMS. Passionate about software architecture and code quality, he never misses an opportunity to share best practices and tries to live up to his educational aspirations through public speaking and blogging. You can read his thoughts on code and other things at uh, uh, elaineschlesher.com uh, or say hello on Twitter under the handle at Schlesser. And please help me welcome Elaine, 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 Schlesser. So, uh, hello everyone. Um, the, before I start, uh, a quick word on um, the planned target audience for this talk. So, it's mainly a developer talk that uh, focuses on people that might have their own plugins or their own custom code that ties into the admin backend of WordPress and that might be affected by the changes that uh, Gutenberg introduces. So this is not about how end users will deal with Gutenberg, this is how about uh, how plugin developers and uh, site builders will um, site developers will um, be affected by Gutenberg and how they can handle it. So first of all, um, Gutenberg will not only give us a new shiny editing experience, it will uh, drastically change some of the architectural uh, decisions that, um, that the editing experience is based on. So there's a few uh, rather major shifts that are happening with Gutenberg and um, they will force you to adapt to this uh, with, a, with any custom development that might, uh, might uh, directly uh, coincide with, uh, with the areas that Gutenberg touches for now. Uh, as you might know, the editing experience is the first phase of what Gutenberg changes, but it's planned to go beyond that and uh, in uh, later phases also add this block-based uh, approach to other areas in the, in the admin backend. So for now we're only concerned by the editing uh, page, so if you edit a post, that's the only area where Gutenberg right now changes things, but it will expand beyond that. So of these architectural changes, the first one and a very obvious one is that everything all of a sudden moves from server to client. Um, so right now, if you go to the post editing screen and you make changes to the post editor and you click update, you will see that um, the browser tries to reload the page. This is because the changes you made are sent to the server and then the server will process these changes per system to the database and then send you a new version of the post editing page that, uh, uh, that contains these changes that you wanted to store. This, in, um, as in conceptually, if you want to visualize this, you can see, as I've shown here in the diagram, that the general state is served on the server side and the server always sends output to the client. The client displays that output and if you click on a link, on that output, the link you clicked will request a new uh, version of that page or another page from the server. So the server gets the request and generates new output to show to you. This is how the old traditional way of WordPress uh, works. And with Gutenberg, we will now move this to the client side. And this basically means that the server sends logic and data to the client. Um, in case that's not clear, the client here is your browser uh, as a practical result. So the server sends logic and data to the client and then you stay within that client. The client 
manages its state uh, all on its own uh, while you're making the changes, while you click around, while you move blocks around and create new ones, delete old ones. And only when you go outside of that post editing screen will you get back to the server context and the server will send you a new page to load. So while you're in the post editor with Gutenberg, you are exclusively working inside of the client side of uh, things and the client only uh, sporadically makes data exchanges with the server. But the server is not responsible for generating the output that you see. That is all handled on the client side. So this is a very, very fundamental change um, which uh, has a lot of implications down the road and we will touch on, upon some of them. The most, uh, the most uh, impactful one is the next architectural change which is the cause of that is that if you work on the client side your code runs in the browser on, on someone's laptop. So you cannot just make a request to the database because the database does not exist in the client's context. There is no database because you're not on your server. Um, so if you want to do data requests, if you want to query something, if you want to store something to the database, you need to pass through the REST API, which is a protocol that allows the client and the server to communicate and to exchange data. So you cannot do a SQL query to directly grab something from the database, you can only make a request to the REST API and then uh, process the response that you got from the REST. However, with this REST API, uh, there's a few caveats that you need to be aware of um, when you're actually building your solutions around this. So first of all, requests are expensive in terms of their processing execution. Um, so where, for example, if you do a, a direct database request, um, it will usually land on the same server or a server that's geographically very, very close to your web server, and the request will be handled in, in a matter of milliseconds. All of a sudden, these simple requests turn into network round trips. And these network round trips, given that the one executing these is the client, so the browser, that client might actually be on a completely different continent than where your server is uh, located at. So this network round trip is much, much slower at several orders of magnitude uh, than a direct database request. So this means that you really need to redu reduce the number of requests because they are very, very costly in terms of uh, time. Then another effect is that these requests are also expensive in terms of bandwidth, which might actually be the type of expensive that you can express in dollars. Um, not everyone has cheap, reliable uh, flat rates uh, for data access. So if you do a REST API request and you get a huge response back, uh, that consumes bandwidth that might be very expensive for the people uh, that are running your code. So if someone is on a smartphone uh, in, uh, um, in a third world country where they might uh, be able to barely pay their, their telephone fees, uh, if you just waste their bandwidth with random requests to the REST API and big responses, um, that is the type of expensive that actually costs real money to real people. So that's... Um, not only should you reduce the number of requests, but you should also try to only ever grab the things that you really need and not much more. Uh, another issue you might face when you try to now use this REST API is that the REST API, in terms of its expressiveness, is purposefully uh, limited. So it is based on the HTTP verbs. So there's a get, there's a post, there's a lead, uh, a delete, um, and the REST API is meant to deal with resources. So you have a given set of resources, and for any resources you have the basic operations, like read, write, delete, etc. Um, if you compare this to the type of expressing, uh, expressiveness you can do with a database or with PHP code, uh, you um, you will 
will see that this is much more difficult to then actually design your interactions, your, um, your data requests and so on in a meaningful way and often means that uh, you'll have trouble probably mapping old behavior to this new REST API paradigm. It might require you to rethink some of the assumptions because they're not uh, an immediate fit to how the web works and how the REST API uh, works. Um, the next big change with Gutenberg is that it is built on top of React components. Um, so Gutenberg uses React as its base framework for displaying the user interface. It is um, a type of reactive programming where uh, you modify the state and any time the state changes, the visual representation of that, of that change is automatically updated because it is reactive. Um, so these React components, they are uh, very modular and um, it basically means that um, you build code where instead of having one big piece of logic that deals with all the different interactions, you will split this up into self-contained <coughs> components and each component only takes, uh, only um, is responsible for one small part of the interaction and then the art is to properly assemble these components and um, pick the granularity of these components so that the, the entirety of it creates this new type of interaction that you want. Um, with these components, uh, you can think a, a bit um, the, the change that you need to do. You can think a bit uh, as of when you pass from procedural code to object-oriented code. Um, this is the same as here from your normal linear HTML to React components that are self-contained objects and you assemble these objects. So it's a bit of a similar transition you need to do. Um, but you don't need to start from scratch because WordPress will ship with uh, a lot of base components that you can use to build upon. So you can extend them, you can combine them uh, in uh, new ways. Uh, so you don't need to build something from scratch. You can start with the base build and building blocks that, that WordPress offers. Um, there's um, uh, a reference, uh, a list of uh, reference documentation for these components uh, at the Gutenberg handbook. So you find it under uh, wordpress.org slash Gutenberg slash handbook and there's a section on components where we'll see a list of the available components that you can build upon. The next big thing uh, that, um, that you need to wrap your head around is the kind of data flow uh, that will be included with Gutenberg. So Gutenberg uses uh, Redux as is its data flow uh, underpinning. It, um, a Redux means that the state and the state changes, they only ever flow in one direction. Um, this sounds very ominous and uh, does not tell you much probably. It basically means that whenever you got a given state into your code, you can rely on that state not changing. So you can make the assumption that whatever you got, it stays that way and you don't need to add any checks, don't need to fear any concurrency issues or, or similar things. And this works by creating a type of <coughs> circular data flow by um, having the state always be injected on, uh, onto the top of the tree of the object hierarchy and the state then traverses this entire object hierarchy and at the end it goes back to Redux. Redux looks at what was requested as changes to the state, applies the changes and then re-injects the changed state in a new iteration into the object tree again. So to make changes, you don't actually modify the state that you get, but you create a change request that you pass on 
to Redux. So this change request will cause the state to be different the next time around you get the state. So it's a, an iterative circular approach and you don't ever make direct changes, you request changes and you'll get the modified state the next time around. Uh, so to, to do this, there's a bit of a vocabulary, vocabulary, vocabulary that uh, React and Redux use. Uh, to make a change request, it's called an action. Don't confuse this with the term action that you use in WordPress space. We're talking about a different type of action here. The naming is a bit, uh, uh, a bit unfortunate. In most other uh, areas, you would actually call this either um, an event or a command. Uh, most uh, frameworks actually work with the term command because you give an order to the surrounding framework to make a change. Here it's called action in Redux, so we, we just need to live with the fact that we now have two elements that are called actions in WordPress. But, but keep in mind that this is a different one than the one you know from the PHP side of things. And these actions, they are collected while the state passes through your object hierarchy. And at the end, uh, Redux uses a concept called reducers. So a reducer is a piece of code you can provide that knows how to turn a given action and an existing state into a modified state that takes the action into account. So it's called reducer because it takes two elements, current state, it requests a change, and it reduces it to the modified state, so the state that is ready for the next iteration. Um, there's um, an abstraction that WordPress uses, which you can find under the JavaScript package WordPress slash data. And this abstraction is basically Redux, but with a few changes so that you can uh, use it across plugin boundaries. Because typically JavaScript is a language that you normally bundle, so you have one application and one collection of code and that's it. And with WordPress that's not the case, because you have multiple bundles you will compile with JavaScript. You have the core bundle and you have a bundle for each plugin. And so this abstraction that WordPress provides allows you to com combine these multiple bundles so that they can all collaborate on the same Redux data. This all sounds very complicated if you've never dealt with JavaScript before. Um, I just wanted to let you know what the paradigm shift is, uh, that the state is immutable in the current execution context, uh, context and we can only request changes for the next iteration. And for the details, if you happen to be uh, in the situation where you need to implement this yourself, there is lots of good documentation you can find on, on Redux and the associated uh, concepts. Um, I, I don't want to go in too much into depth there. So don't be too much afraid about this complicated way of how state is handled. It basically means that um, you can rely on a few given factors that make it easier to build code that doesn't break at scale when, when stuff becomes complicated. So, this is all uh, very new concepts, uh, looks all very interesting, but when you have a current plugin or a current custom site, how you get from here to there? Um, the obvious choice might be to just rewrite the entire thing with these new concepts, but this causes a few issues, mainly if uh, you have a business, for example, while you're rebuilding this, your old code is outdated and your new, new code is not ready yet. So you don't want to put yourself into a position where you just bet on being able to make a working product in one year's time because you work, rewrite everything from scratch. In terms of uh, uh, um, business, uh, business process, in terms of cash flow, that's just not a good solution. So usually you don't want to, um, you, you want to go at this in a gradual way and be able to always gather feedback all the time, always have a working product all the time. 
So we'll look now at how you can split the rewriting process of your existing code up into several granular steps that build one on top of each other and that always leave you with the working usable result um, that, that keeps your cash flow going. So first of all, uh, the most basic changes, changes you can make is to use server-side rendering. Uh, server-side rendering is also called dynamic blocks in, in the Gutenberg terminology. And it basically means that, yes, you create a Gutenberg block, but that block does not know how to render itself. It just requests the output from the server. So basically back at what I've shown you in the beginning, where the server sends the output instead of the data and the logic. Uh, Server-side render is an existing component that makes this possible. It basically works by, create, by, by providing a base block that you can just attach a server-side callback to, so a, a, a piece of PHP code that will render HTML. And every time the block is asked to update itself, it will through the REST API, uh, trigger the callback on the PHP side. PHP will render the HTML that you requested and will send this as response through the REST API back to this block. So you only deal with the PHP side of things and you can reuse your existing PHP code. So if you have a short code, for example, um, that already does its, its job by making direct database requests and then generating HTML out of it. You can just turn this into a server-side render component and wrap it into a Gutenberg block and all of a sudden you're already making use of Gutenberg while still reusing your old existing PHP code with direct database access. Uh, keep in mind that this is meant to provide uh, a legacy opportunity for people to, to create blocks and it comes with some performance uh, um, with some performance uh, implications because uh, every time your block is rendered it will trigger this callback and you must ensure that this callback is not too slow to, to have everything grind to a halt. Uh, this can be done by a clever caching, for example, of the callback so that it, that it does not always render from scratch, but uh, only every five minutes or similar, uh, similar functionality. Here's an example of how such a server-side render block can look. So you can see on the top left side that I register a block with a given set of attributes and this block has a render callback attached to it. Uh, the render callback, the, the value that I put into it, it's basically just a PHP callable. So here it's a function, it could also be a class method or whatever else you want to use. At the lower bottom we see a template uh, that uh, renders some basic HTML and in the top right we see our callback that, um, that um, uses output buffering to render this template into HTML and return it uh, to uh, the code that was uh, requesting it. And when you now add this code you will see that you will have a new block, uh, what did we call it, WCSEA and uh, anywhere you put this block into, it will request HTML from the server and it will render the template you see at the bottom. Um, so I've, um, I've stated several times now that normally with PHP code you do direct database access and that doesn't work with Gutenberg anymore. So this is the main issue you will be facing when you have existing code uh, because it does not only mean that you need to completely overhaul your user interface, it does mean that all your logic that you have on the server side uh, is basically useless because it could not possibly run on the client side. Even if you translated it to JavaScript, it would not work because it just assumes 
that it would have database access. That's why a next logical step um, to be able to move gradually would be to start creating an abstraction for your own code. Um, so an abstraction of the data layer basically means that uh, you put a piece of code in between your regular logic and whatever it is that you use to read and write data from. Uh, this allows you to, uh, to decouple these two and would allow you to keep the logic going no matter what current storage mechanism you're currently using, which is what we're after, actually. Um, so once you have this abstraction in place and your logic is adapted to only ever work with this abstraction, it creates a protective layer and beneath this abstraction you can make changes freely and rapidly without uh, uh, needing to fear that you will break some of the logic uh, on the other side of the abstraction. Um, I wanted to visually uh, represent this, so just assume that your existing code will directly query the database, usually by using WPDB. It could be worse, though, that you even directly uh, do MySQL calls or so, but usually people should use WPDB. Um, when you want to add REST API access to this, there is no obvious way to just slide it in somewhere to have part of the code be direct database access and part of the code already be transla translated to the REST API. So it's an all or nothing approach. Uh, basically, if you want to use REST API instead, it means breaking all the code and replacing everything by a REST API based approach. And depending on what code you have, that might be a matter of six months, of one year, of two years maybe, of rewriting and testing everything until you're, you have a working product again. So if you put an abstraction layer in place, all of a sudden the code is decoupled from the database. And this allows you to randomly change whatever you want below this abstraction layer, and you can even have partial changes. So you can have from, from your 20 requests, you can have 10 requests that go to the database still, because that's the part of the code that you haven't yet adapted to Gutenberg, and the other 10 go to the REST API instead, because that's the part that you had already modernized. So it allows you to move gradually and keep it working all the time. Here's a bit of a code example of how that could look. This is, of course, extremely simplified. It just it's meant to, to illustrate base principle. So instead of doing direct requests for something, here we have, um, you know, we have a custom post type books, and instead of directly using this custom post type, instead of directly making requests to the database, we create an interface book repository, and this interface just states the methods that we need. So for example, we have a method find all, that allows us to retrieve all the books. And while designing this interface, at first we don't care how this is implemented. And then, in the first step, we can provide an implementation that is based on WPDB and basically fulfills this contract that we set up by using WP Query to retrieve all the books. And all of a sudden, if our logic only ever deals with the book repository interface, instead of with WPDB. We can make immediate changes to the way we retrieve the actual data in a transparent way without the logic breaking anymore. But why use the REST API on the server side now? Because this abstraction basically means that um, yeah, you would use REST API already, but you haven't yet written the JavaScript code. So um, what's the point in using REST API on the server side? Well, the point again is to allow you to make gradual changes. And for example, you can already use the REST API ex uh, um, exclusively on the server side, uh, which allows you 
to model everything, to design everything, to test everything, um, while uh, keeping everything working. And um, the REST API, once it is in place, it doesn't care anymore whether you're on the server or on the client. So instead of starting with client code and then building everything in a very risky way to make the client code work, uh, we go the other way around. We uh, abstract away uh, the things on the server that make it server only. And by doing that, we will end up with code that already uses the REST API. It still runs on the server, but then it's just a matter of translating it into JavaScript, and it will immediately work, because we've set the groundwork to make it work already. Um, here we have another implementation of our book repository interface, and this time we've called it RESTful Book Repository, because we're already using the REST API, but still in PHP on the server side. And um, this uses the fact that the REST API, the way it is building in WordPress, is just by uh, running a lot of objects that collaborate together, you can directly use these objects on the server side to make requests to the REST API without incurring the network overhead. So instead of making an external request through a URL to the server, we can actually directly create the objects we need from the REST API and use the REST API endpoints without needing it to make a network round trip. So we get direct, immediate REST API access. We can test everything. We can model everything. We have a lot of time to do a proper design of our REST API endpoints. But all the time, this keeps working, and it does not even slow down our code, because right now we're not yet even doing network round trips. Um, so now we have um, we have an abstract data layer. We are ready to make uh, the REST API work for us. The next step um, is a bit of a special one because for most of you, you will not be able to just say, my product from now on will only work with Gutenberg because not everyone will have Gutenberg in every single combination of their site. Not everyone is able to immediately use it and you don't want to just um, exclude half of your customer base because they, they happen to not yet be migrated over to Gutenberg. So ideally you want to make your code work with or without Gutenberg. So this is what this next step is about. Um, if you're now starting to build your new um, React-based, shiny JavaScript front-end uh, magic, um, to make everything work inside of Gutenberg, you should think about building it in such a way that you can use this independently of Gutenberg. It just happens to use React, but it doesn't require Gutenberg to work. Uh, what does this mean? So, um, with Gutenberg, we can imagine at least three scenarios. Pre-5.0 sites, post IOs, uh, post 5.0 sites with Gutenberg active and post 5.0 sites with the classic editor active. And um, if we manage to reuse our components across these three different scenarios, we can reduce a lot of the maintenance overhead because it's always preferable to build something that is slightly more complex and reusable across everything than to have uh, a branching in our code base where, where we basically need to maintain two different code bases that target two different platforms. This is always much more costly in terms of maintenance and we want to avoid that. So an example um, that already does that is um, the, um, the WordPress SEO plugin by Yoast. Um, they uh, did a lot of work to create their, their integrations into the editing screen so that it's all based on React. Um, but uh, if you look at how it is implemented, you can see, for example, here in the screenshot, this is uh, with Gutenberg active, you can see on the right side, 
uh, in the sidebar, there's um, the stuff that the plugin does to, 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 to help you make decisions. And you can see in the developer tools at the bottom that these are React components. But if you have the same plugin and you disable Gutenberg, you will see that you have the same component in a meta box below your traditional old school editing screen. And if you look into the developer tools, you can see that uh, you can see that it's still the same React components. And uh, they are doing this by creating a meta box that provides a container that mirrors the Gutenberg environment. This Gutenberg environment, uh, it's a very basic, uh, uh, basic abstraction of what real Gutenberg does, but it allows the existing React component to just hook into that meta box instead of the Gutenberg sidebar. Uh, so the component is exactly the same. It doesn't need to be adapted to multiple platforms. It's just that they spend a bit of time to create a meta box that can, that can accept these React components in the same way that Gutenberg does. Um, the, here's a basic uh, piece of code that, uh, that shows how this is done. So WordPress provides packages that you can just pull in through NPM um, that are the same packages that Core will use starting with version 5.0. But you can already pull them in with other versions or, or outside of Gutenberg and we use the exact same packages. And with these packages you can set up an environment uh, that, uh, that mirrors uh, what you would have in Gutenberg. So here it uh, includes this uh, snippet editor for example uh, inside of a meta box and the meta box basically provides the fill mechanism and the sidebar implementation that Gutenberg normally provides. Now for the final integration, uh, in the long run you want to control fragmentation of your code, so make sure that you uh, try to avoid just splitting up your code base into Gutenberg and non-Gutenberg. You want to get rid of anything that uh, is not, um, not reusable across all the environments. Uh, you should keep your code base uh, flexible because Gutenberg is moving fast. We're not yet sure what phase 2, 3 or 10 will bring. Uh, so you should put yourself into a position where you can easily adapt to change. That is probably the most valuable approach you can, you can take. And finally, once you've covered all the bases, think about how to properly embrace good work, how to actually make the most out of the different user interface that Gutenberg provides because the user experience that you designed for the old editor might have been the best one you could, could come up for the old editor, but it's probably not the best one you can come up for the new one. So the key takeaways, reuse existing code through the server-side render component, abstract away your data model and move it to the REST API, build React containers with reusable React components, Finalize a tight user interface and user experience integration, and most importantly, stay flexible and adapt to change. That's it for me. Okay, questions? All the components are based on uh, React basis, right? So, yeah. if it is React basis, so will it be accessible for using the standard JS functions to develop a plugin or in, uh, using good uh, You mean like using jQuery, for example? Um, jQuery, like uh, yeah. JavaScript functionalities. Yes, so th that will be problematic uh, because uh, the, the paradigm is a different one. So for very basic things, you might still be able to pull it off to use something like jQuery, for example, or base JavaScript functions. Um, but these, generally in your, the state model that React uses, and 
if you build everything so that it has immutable state and then use jQuery to go in there and make changes nevertheless, that would probably lead to a lot of difficult to diagnose bugs later on. So uh, it's not a good approach. Ideally, you would work with components. They might not necessarily uh, use React, but at least you should be aware of how the state flows inside a Bootwork editor and make sure not, you're not disrupting that uh, state flow. All right. Hi. <clears throat> what does this mean for people who are non-coders? Um, so for non-coders, um, it generally means that if all the plugin authors and the theme authors now do all of this, then you need to worry too much about things. Um, if you have uh, websites, uh, for example, that you run, it might mean that you need to hire developers to make changes once Gutenberg comes, because not everything just works out of the box. And depending on what you're using, that makes deeper integrations into the editing backend. Uh, you might need to replace plugins or change some of the custom code. And so it might mean that you need uh, to spend some, uh, some time and money and uh, maybe hire a developer uh, to, to adapt your, uh, your sites to this new way of working. For everything you oh, sorry. for everything you were talking about, um, does that affect mainly just the editing mode, or would uh, a page view by a normal person on the internet cause these REST APIs to be called in React components to render for something as simple as like a paragraph? Uh, so for um, for normal Gutenberg components, it works that way that. The JavaScript logic of the component is only executed on the editor side, in the admin backend, and when you save your page, it, um, it generates the output for that component and stores the output of the component into the post content field in the database. So on the front end, normally, you just read the end result. Uh, so no JavaScript code is being executed. Um, it, it should just work. Um, but this is how it should behave. This doesn't mean that plugins will now uh, do other things that might cause JavaScript to execute or something. And it also, it's different for dynamic blocks. So dynamic blocks, like I showed with the server-side uh, render component, they don't store their result in the database. Uh, they only store a reference to the block they, 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 they are, the they, they block ID and its attributes, how it was configured, and every time the dynamic block is meant to be displayed, it will actually be passed out of the content and this render callback will be triggered to retrieve the real HTML content and that will be pasted in. So for dynamic blocks, they actually incur uh, at least one REST API request uh, because that REST API request is the one that uh, triggers the render callback on the server side. Any other questions? Thank you. Uh, interesting talk. I'm also not on the developer end of the spectrum, but could you describe um, the intent of these structural changes, other than the benefits of being able to um, not have errors that propagate so easily, is this more efficient in terms of it's not requiring, these websites will not require so much bandwidth in the future because so much is happening now on the, on the user end, or um, could you describe the intent of the structural change? Do you mean the structural changes that Gutenberg introduces? Correct. Yeah. yeah. Um, so. Um, Gutenberg is mainly focused on changing the editing experience, and it's not so much about how it will behave on the front end. Actually, right now, um, they're still working on optimizing the front end output so that it doesn't incur performance hit when, when Gutenberg is being used. 
so it's all about making a shiny new editing experience that allows you to stay in, in that editor and have everything be very interactive. Uh, but that means that uh, uh, while, while they designed it, the, the topmost priority was the admin backend, not how it behaves on the front end. Uh, of course, this was considered as well what it means for the front end, but there's still some things that need to be figured out to optimize it properly, because right now it will be slightly less performant than the old way of having the front end. So it's more circumstantial? Yes. So is, is, is this going to change the file structure? So we're all used to like going in and FTPing in and looking at the PHP files and such. Is this going to be a whole new paradigm of what we'll be looking at on the back end? Uh, yes, absolutely. Um, this is one of the main criticisms of Gutenberg, actually, uh, because it will change from PHP files that you can just modify and immediately see the results to modern JavaScript code that needs to be compiled and bundled before it can be executed. Uh, so we need to have a build pipeline that always compiles the JavaScript code. If you just make a change in a file, it does not do anything because you're not executing the source files. You're executing the result that was generated by a build pipeline. So you not only need to learn JavaScript and the syntax, etc., you also need to learn how to set up the build tools and build a proper build pipeline that compiles and bundles the JavaScript code. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it's uh, certainly uh, a big change from PHP, and it, um, it is a big change away from what has traditionally been one of the strong points of WordPress, that anyone can just tinker with it and learn while, while building. With, uh, with this new React-based JavaScript approach, um, there's a lot more steps involved, and it's a much steeper learning curve to just get started. Time for one more question. This is not a very basic kind of question, but let's say you um, want to extend an existing block, and you just want to say button, and you want it to have a border hover state. I saw how you do that, but you would have to go through the same, you know, build like a plugin with your, the same build process, you know, and compile a separate JavaScript. You couldn't just uh, add attributes, or is that, is that correct? Uh, so, for, for basic uh, use cases, you can use um, uh, an older syntax of JavaScript that, um, so let, let me step back. So with JavaScript, JavaScript in a, is in a constant state of flux. The, the language is being reinvented all the time, and there's older versions of the syntax that the browsers can directly execute because the browsers have caught on to that syntax, and there's more newer versions of the syntax that are not yet directly executable by the browsers because they didn't have the time yet to implement everything. So this, these new types of syntax versions they are transpiled into older versions so that they can be executed in the browser. And for simpler use cases, you can actually use an older type of the syntax uh, without any bundling and just have a, a basic JavaScript file that can directly be executed in the browser and you can then just enqueue this JavaScript file and then that will work. But it's... Yes, yes. But as soon as you start doing more complex changes, this will quickly fall apart because uh, you need to pull in all sorts of dependencies to make this work. And in a non-bundled, non-compiled version of JavaScript, you cannot pull in these dependencies. That does not work. If you just want to do something simple, do you advise me you know, going through all the dependencies, or should I just use the uh, you know, vanilla JavaScript and go that route? Uh, if you want to do something very simple, if you want to do, the, if you want to start from scratch, then absolutely start with a basic JavaScript file. Uh, but there's also another option. There's a few, uh, uh, few ways of creating a block where everything already works, 
uh, in terms of scaffolding the entire setup, and you can just put your logic in. And the entire build pipeline is already set up. There's one called Create Guten Block by Amada Rice. Um, WPCLI provides a way to scaffold. So depending on what it is, it might make sense to just use that kind of scaffolding to get you set up with a proper flow. And, and you can already do a minor change and it works and then later on slowly learn what it's actually doing, what you've built. Great talk. Thank you, Alain. Thank you. Thank you.